Hey there, my name is Markus Fick. I'm a business development manager with Gunfos Commercial Building Services. And first of all, thank you for tuning into this webcast. Today, we're going to talk about building information modeling and how you can avoid what we call the data trap. Now, the content that I'm going to walk you through, we actually used that for a series of webinars earlier this summer. So in the future, if you want to have the option to interact uh, directly or live with uh, me and some of my colleagues, be sure to go and sign up for the Grundfos for Engineers newsletter. So you will get invites for upcoming webinars and also receive interesting articles, application knowledge straight from me and some of my other colleagues. But without further ado, let's get into building information modeling. So just to give you a heads up on what we're going to walk through, we're going to start with a general introduction to building information modeling. Then we're going to dabble into how suppliers uh, should approach BIM. Then just have a little bit of talk about what is it that Grundfos actually uh, provides. And we're going to end with a series of, let's call it tips and tricks on how to get started with BIM and where you can find other resources. So a general introduction to building information modeling. If we start by, by just asking the question, what is BIM? Let's look at the ISO definition, where it states that it's a shared digital representation of physical and functional characteristics of any built object. That includes buildings, bridges, roads, and so on, which forms a reliable basis for decisions. So already now we begin to, to uh, see that it's not just about buildings. BIM is really taking off in a lot of other disciplines, so infrastructure, entire cities, water utility networks, but it did originate primarily uh, within buildings. If we look at the NBS definition, which goes you know, a bit more in, in, into detail, it says that it's a rich information model consisting of potentially multiple data sources. And truth be told, it'll always be multiple data sources, um, which can be shared across all stakeholders and be maintained across the life of a building from inception to uh, recycling. And the model, the information model can include contract, specification properties, personal programming, quantities, cost base, and geometry. So what this boils down to is that BIM really is about all stakeholders contributing to, you could say, a central database of information related to a specific uh, specific project. And is it BIM is, is aimed at efficient program delivery and preventing the huge and necessary waste that, that occurs on most construction projects. Um, and instead of each discipline working alone in a, in a common contractual environment, the advantage of BIM is really to bring everybody together, so clients, architects, engineers, and contractors, and have them work together collaboratively to provide efficient design through effective communication at all levels. I know this might sound as common sense, but you would probably also agree with me that that is hardly the case in, in, in the world today. And it will require significant both cultural and, technologi and technological changes, um, which is coming. If we look at how data flows through through a traditional project, you would have all the disciplines, so architect, structural, MEP, uh, controls a building owner, um, all communicating without being connected. Uh, so we really have the spider web. What BIM does is that it facilitates um, a set of processes um, where people share and provide the information into one model or one repository so that when an architect changes something on his drawings, it is immediately reflected um, in the data that's available to the other parties uh, in the project. And why is this a good thing? If we look at 
um, some of the targets set forward by, by the UK government. Uh, as you may be aware, the UK recently imposed what's called the BIM mandate, saying that all government contracts must, must adhere to a certain level um, of uh, building information modeling. Um, and first of all, it's going to lower cost. It's going to lower the cost of construction. If we coordinate better, if you say if the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, we're going to lower our cost by by one third. By having this coordination, by having less iterations, by simulating construction, <clears throat> sorry, by simulating construction um, in a in a computer environment before committing to concrete, we should be able to deliver those buildings in half the time. Doing all of that, well, it'll also be good for the environment because we'll, again, have less do over work, less confusion, less idling. So we'll be lowering our emissions throughout construction by a third, but also we should be able to optimize the way that those buildings or those projects are, are operating once they're built. So we can achieve a better energy efficiency and less emissions on, on our constructions. I wanna quickly go through the different disciplines uh, involved in, you could say, the BIM process. Um, it, it's a valuable tool for every step of the building life cycle. And first we have 3D. And this is where a lot of people think BIM stops or what BIM really is, uh, that it's just 3D CAD. But as you will soon discover, it's not. Of course, we start with designing our building in 3D, whether we use Revit, Bentley MicroStation, SketchUp, or any other platform, we really use more than just geometry. We also have data. We know how much electricity the pump draws, how much water it moves. And um, as design condition changes, those changes are instantly affecting every other construction drawing, procurement schedule, uh, and so on associated with that model. For the construction industry, there's a high productivity gain uh, by working in 3D and being able to do class detection. But since we also have a lot of data available on the building products, we can use that data for much more. For example, scheduling, or which is referred to as uh, 4D BIM. So scheduling software allows project facing simulations and uh, team scheduling. And estimation software knows everything that goes into the building and voila, you have 5D BIM which gives us quantity extractions and real-time conceptualization modeling. We can also optimize our design through simulation tools for, let's say, energy optimization or increased sustainability. Whether this is tracking how our building will rank on the lead scale or to optimize HVAC set points for thermal comfort, all of that is based on data that's in our collaborative model. So the tools, the software that we use um, to, to, to reach those optimizations, they are all dependent on the information in the model. And finally, and this is an area that is see, really taking off over the last year, is 70 or facilities management or, um, or operations, if you will, so that the building operator can utilize the information in the, uh, the, in the BIM environment to do uh, life cycle strategies, make sure that the building is, is commissioned as specified, that it's running as intended. Um, so it really opens up for, for a whole nother level of, of, uh, of operation validity. And some of you, or you, you might have seen these charts before, it really just I wanna illustrate that by applying BIM technology, we move from, from a typical flow where you would have you know, information being accumulated um, in a building process, and then we start over from scratch when we do the handover. Whereas with, with BIM, you know, with the desired data flow, we have a gradual increase of information from inception to operation. So data is developed and enhanced at each stage of the building's life and it can be made available at the appropriate level for each uh, for each stage and thus we avoid information overload a uh, final 
um, example, and you say this theoretical introduction to what is BIM, is uh, I want to show this is, 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 is the BIM implementation plan that's uh, often referred to when, when you look at the, the UK mandate. And it really just shows that we are moving from what they refer to as, as level zero, where everything is in CAD and we have drawings, we have lines, to we begin to move into, into 3D and then level two BIM, which is really we begin to add data. And then we move towards collaboration, towards being integrated, towards having interoperable um, data. And, and that really facilitates the whole life cycle management. Another thing that is often or really a source for a lot of confusion is LOD or level of development. So it's, it's intended as a reference specification that enables practitioners to specify and articulate with a high level of clarity the content and reliability of BIM at various stages in the design and construction process. And there's a reason I say should, because I find that there is a lot of confusion about what LOD is. Um, what I will suggest is that you go to, to bimforum.com slash LOD. They have a very, uh, first of all, thorough, but also very tangible document of what level of development is. But let me just give you uh, an example in, 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 in a pump context. So LOD, it can refer to both the entire project. It can also refer to uh, a building component or product component in your model. The LOD scale goes from 100 to 500, where 500 really is as built. There is a discussion whether or not 500 is really attainable. We're not gonna go into that. But if we start with LOD 100, imagine you have a box so an object that's a box and that box says it's a pump and it uses two horsepower. If we move up to LED 200, we still have a box, but now we say it's a circulation pump and it uses two horsepowers. By moving up to LED 300, we begin to have also the shape or a box with, with extrusions, but it's, um, we're getting more details on what kind of product it is. So we would say it's a box with extrusions and it's a Grundfos Magna 3, 80-120. Moving up to LOD 350, well, then we add it's a specific product number. So we know exactly what product it is. And we have some rudimentary data on how that product works or how it operates. So we would have electrical data. We would have mechanical data. Uh, LOD 400, kind of like LOD 350, to be honest, but imagine if we take all the data that we have on, on a typical uh, procurement or tender document uh, embedded onto that, onto that pump object. So LED 400, same geometry, uh, attention to detail as LED 350, but you will have more data. You would have reference to uh, INOs, to, to service manuals. LED 500 is really an as-built. Um, and, and there is a lot of definitions on, on how uh, LED 500 uh, can be obtained. Uh, again, in the pump context, very similar to LED 400, but you would have a lot of data like full service schedules, uh, replacement kits, uh, spare part references, and so on. Again, if you wanna know more, dig deeper into LED, go by bimforum.com slash LOD and, and work through their, doc, uh, through their document. Now, so what is the BIM challenge? And this is, is my segue into how other manufacturers um, should approach BIM. So the I for BIM, it really stands for information. It's about getting the right level of information into the model at the right time. And that can be a challenge. And the next is then to make it available without loss of integrity or quality throughout the project life cycle so that data is available to everyone who needs it when they need it. So let's talk about how suppliers should approach BIM. So manufacturers like Grundfos, we've been working in 3D for decades. 3D is nothing new, but as we learned, BIM is more than just 3D geometry. And 
the mistake that a lot of building product manufacturers make, and Grunfuss did the same a few years ago, is that we take our 3D source, convert that into, let's say, Autodesk Revit, and then we think we're happy. But honestly, all you get is a glorified box uh, with no data, because BIM is all about is all about data. Um, so getting a manufacturer's, you can say, standard 3D asset, well, that is what leads engineering straight into the BIM data trap. It's a black hole. There is nothing there. It's it's a black box. Um, let's start with just talking about geometry. On the uh, upper right-hand side, uh, you can see a, a, a former model of, uh, of our Grunfuss Magma 3. And that came from a, uh, a staff file source or a Katia source. And that resulted in having a lot of unnecessary geometry like the display, like the signage. Um, it's, it's still a good model, but the size was, was 1.62 megabytes. By scrapping that concept and rebuilding the content from the ground up with just using necessary geometry, that is what you have in the lower left hand side, you can see that they still look very much the same, but the new version is much more simplified from a visual point of view. And by that, well, we reduce the size um, by two thirds or down to, to uh, 0.58 megabytes. And imagine if you have a project, a hospital, you have a lot of components in there. And if all of those components are too heavy geometrically modeled, well, that is going to crash your computer or your server. Um, and so we really want to advocate that you should make your content from the ground up because it's lightweight and it still gives you all the relevant geometry. Uh, and it ensures that your project is not overburdened. Um, then I talked about how do you get information? It's all about data. If we just take those, you know, converted 3D references or CATIA sources, step sources, there is no data. It's like a desert. It's a large empty space. Um, again, comparing our old version to our newer version is we should really switch focus from available data to what is relevant data. So the old one, too heavy on the geometry, it's very high visual detail, and it had limited data. We did have, you know, necessary uh, pipe connectors and electrical connectors, but not really much more than that. On the new one, we of course have what I would say a satisfactory visual detail levels, and you have different renditions. So if you want to work in a coarse or a medium or, or a fine environment, um, you can do that. Uh, but we focused on enriching the data so that it so that, that there is data available for every stage throughout the uh, project lifecycle. And that takes us to the Grunfuss BIM solution. So we put a lot of effort in creating purposely built BIM assets um, from scratch, giving you that lightweight geometry and a focus on including data that is relevant, whether you're, you're a system designer, whether you're a contractor, or whether you're an operator. And I have a quote that says, one size fits all, it's great for socks, but it's terrible when you talk about building information modeling. And that is, of course, because you all have different requirements. If you work, let's say, on a government project in the UK, you might want to have data that's, um, that complies with the parameters laid out in the uh, SIPSI uh, product data template or product data sheet. If you're working on a project in Australia, well, you might want content that's compliant with BIM MEBOS, or you might want something that has COBE parameters. Or if you're in uh, Holland, you might want things that are either compliant with EMCS or ETMRT. The point is, 
everybody is asking for BIM, but the data that you ask for is different. And that's why we, uh, we built a system that allows us to give you, um, you could say, different outputs. So we have our Revit content available for different standards. Same geometry, different data sets. And another small thing that I want to touch upon is that we, of course, include the different renditions for all our type catalogs. So you have the coarse, medium, medium, fine. This does not impact your LOD or your level of development. That is a misconception I'm, I'm often faced with that you can still have a box, in this case, the coarse rendition, but have it include specification data that is relevant to a specific product number. And we, of course, include the, the uh, coarse, medium, fine renditions, first of all, because it's best practice and because some of you might prefer just to work in a blocky environment um, when you're working on your whole model and then you want to switch to, to a finer version to do renditions if you want to render the mechanical room. And speaking of rendering, we've prepared a little um, video for you on... Um, what some of our different content looks like. And I will just start that video right now. Enjoy. Grundfos is pleased to announce its offering of high quality BIM content for use in Revit projects. BIM, or Building Information Modeling, is a rapidly evolving technology that transforms traditional design planning from 2D to 3D environments. These environments understand product relationships, which enable design intent to be more effectively conveyed throughout the design and building lifecycle. Grundfos provides specifiers with a comprehensive BIM library of product-based digital models. These can be used to create custom drawings with greater accuracy and system intelligence than ever before. These models have been developed for use by stakeholders throughout the entire life cycle of a building. Grundfos BIM matches a specifier's common workflow and mirror the logical, hierarchical nature of a designer's selection process. This complete package comes in the form of lightweight files with full product information and functionality. Models integrate with building systems through piping and electrical connection points for system analytics. The entire library of models also implements the latest BIM standards, meaning that placement behavior, appearance, and embedded metadata will match typical design requirements. All right, I hope you enjoyed the first part of our video. I just want to pause it and talk to you about type catalogs. So the reason that we provide uh, type catalogs for, uh, for Revit is that design conditions in a building often changes. And we think that it's more handy for you to have the full portfolio of a product uh, available so that if you want to go up or down a pump size, you already have that information readily available in the object. Um, so you avoid, you know, having you know, to go back to Grimfrost Product Center uh, or Google uh, and find the data for a pump one size up or one size down. And that is why we think type catalogs is a smart thing. Um, now I'm going to go on with the video. Uh, that'll show you how to get and uh, work with our content. Enjoy again. Product lines from Grundfos, including circulators, inlines, boosters, and more, all include BIM content that is easily accessible from the Grundfos Product Center. This provides a comprehensive catalog of easily accessible product models. The models load using a type catalog, containing a vast amount of configurations. These arrangements are all available in select regional standards, automatically adding parameters to the files as needed with the necessary information. Grundfos supplied schedules save specifiers the effort needed to create their own bills of material. The schedules can simply be copied and pasted into any project. They will automatically populate with part attributes and quantify Grundfos pumps within the project. Grundfos content guides are PDF documents that explain model functionality, such as placement and configuration variables. This helps marketing, sales, and project managers to properly select a BIM file without needing to understand the pump in detail. This accessibility places Grundfos product details directly into the hands of specifiers at the time of design and also during construction. 
Grunfoss's BIM offering opens new doors for project specifications, allowing Grunfoss products to be embedded into project specifications earlier in the design process through the power of building information modeling. All right, I hope you enjoyed that part of the video too. I just want to recap on what our BIM solution is. And yes, to begin with, it's for Autodesk Revit. Other platforms are likely to follow. If uh, you need anything for a different platform, um, reach out to us and we'll see how we can accommodate you. Um, but it's a purposely built um, 3D model from the ground up so that we get something that is data light, only the data you need and the geometry you need. We deliver it in three visual details. So if you wanna work in a blocky environment or a fine uh, rendering environment, you can do that. It of course includes exact geometry, the connection data, uh, data points for uh, piping and electrical and operational data, service data, INO data. And finally, for this section, I just want to point out some of the people and, and, and companies that, that we've been working with in, in developing our, our, our BIM concept. Um, because we believe there is room for, for a lot of innovation when it comes to BIM and MEP. And that's why we want to surround us with, with uh, people that are also pushing um, the borders of, uh, of uh, the industry. So we have uh, 3D, Bugari, 3D construction here, here in Denmark that helped us with, with some of the original specification work um, and, and ongoing, uh, ongoing dialogue. Um, also for Autodesk, that has been a, a trusted partner for us. Um, and BIM my boss from, from uh, Australia. Um, one of the things about BIM Abbas that is really interesting is that they have come up with a very thorough uh, standard template and approach, but it's really driven by, by, uh, by the whole uh, community. So you have manufacturers, contractors, designers, all coming together and saying, well, how do we make BIM work for us? Um, and I think it's one of the most uh, well worked through uh, approaches um, in the world and, and certainly uh, go to the BIM Mebos website, no matter where you are in the world, and have a look at some of the documentation uh, for, for BIM implementation uh, that might be applicable to, to your firm. Um, also, you can find our content uh, both in Grand Product Center, but also BIM Object. Um, we are, of course, involved with with uh, with, with with Ashray, um, and there we are, you know, discussing how we can can again increase the applicability of, of BIM within the the HVAC space. Uh, Unify that uh, creates uh, our content, uh, but Unify also has one of the, if not the most amazing enterprise uh, content platform. Um, so if you're looking at managing content uh, in your firm, uh, check out Unify. Um, then the Building Content Summit, uh, which is a, is a conference uh, both in, in US and, and in Europe this year, which is really dedicated to discuss BIM content uh, across all, all disciplines. Um, and, and we've been receiving great feedback uh, from the delegates um, at the BCS. And if you're someone that's looking into getting getting started um, with BIM, this would also be a very, very good place to start. Um, and that's the segue to the next section, how to get started with BIM. So my first advice is really take the time to learn about BIM and what it means for your disciplines. Maybe this webcast is one of the first, uh, one of your first exposures uh, to BIM. Then I hope I did manage to send you off to a, to a good start. Start by looking at how you currently work and how this may have to evolve to accommodate these new processes. Uh, but take it one step at a time. Um, also, try to cut through some of, let's say, some of the mumbo jumbo that's out there. Um, and understand how first defining and then implementing your BIM strategy will produce a significant advantage 
uh, for your career. Uh, I mean, BIM is uh, fundamentally changing the way that we design and construct and operate buildings. Uh, so this is where the future is. And then, of course, you need to go and play around with some content. Uh, you can find all the Grunfos content at Grunfos Product Center. Um, you can also go to repositories like, like BIM Object. You'll find much more than just pumps. Um, and try to make up for yourself what you think is good content. Uh, what content will work for you? What are your requirements? What do you need to get your job done? And once you've dealt with that, start thinking about, well, what data that maybe you don't need would create value for somebody that would uh, work uh, on your project downstream. And of course, there's a lot of information, a lot of learning you can get right from behind your desk or on your phone. I mean, Google BIM on YouTube and you will find countless of, of, of information videos. If you're getting started with, with uh, software um, like Revit, um, maybe start by modeling your house or your apartment. Uh, Lynda.com has some, some uh, great uh, tutorial uh, packages. Um, also move on to things like, like Autodesk University. Um, it's a series of conferences um, that take place all over the world. The major one is in uh, Las Vegas every year by the end of the year. I think this year it's November. Um, you can also go check out things like, like RTC um, and, and the Building Content Summit, again, involved in, in, in the community. Um, what I find is that this is a community that really wants to help and a community of very passionate individuals that have no problems with, you say, sharing uh, their secrets and helping you move forward. And if you also like reading, I want to point out uh, two books that are very, very different. The first one is Data Driven Design and Construction by Randy Deutsch. Uh, it's also been used as curriculum um, for, for, for architects and, and engineers. So it really deals with how to use data throughout your design and your construction process. It deals with how innovative individuals and firms are using data to remain competitive while still advancing their their practices and it documents how data-driven design really is a new frontier and the convergence between BIM and architectural and computational analysis and associated tools. Um, if you are looking into getting into say BIM managing or you maybe you are a BIM manager, uh, Dominic Holzer, a professor from Australia, uh, wrote this book called The BIM Manager's Handbook. Uh, a guide for professionals in architecture, engineering, and construction, where he interviewed, I think it's about 50 people um, from some of the top tier uh, and most innovative firms um, around the world. So it's really more of a, you could say, a managerial handbook for for uh, for BIM managers. Um, and it's a really good uh, read. Actually, it was on a, on a top top five list of uh, must read uh, BIM books uh, this year. So what can you expect from Grunfos in the future? Right now we are working on finalizing our portfolio for building services. So you will be seeing more assets in the Grunfos product center throughout the year and we will release and update content regularly. One way to stay um, informed about this is uh, go check out uh, Grunfos for Engineering. We will be sure to to post updates uh, updates there, and it'll be in our newsletters as well. But before I say goodbye, I want to give you a little glimpse of the future, and I want to start by a quote uh, from Bill Gates that the most meaningful way to differentiate your company from your competition is to do an outstanding job with information, how you gather manage and use information will determine whether you win or lose. So all that's left now is to say thank you and thank you for staying with me uh, throughout this webcast. If you have comments, feedback, questions, I would love to hear from you. My email is on the slide. And for more things related to building information modeling, be sure to stay tuned on Grunfos for Engineers. 
have a good day.